Hey there and welcome. I'm sorry, that's not my usual introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. My name is Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks, and you are joining us live for Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents, episode number 59. Today, we're going to be talking about RHEL for the Edge uh, with, uh, with our partners over at OnLogic. But before we do, I have to bring in my co-host, Mr. Brian Smith. Wait a minute. You're not Brian. No, but we have the same haircut. <laughs> and we're both nice people. Yes to the first. I, I question the second. We'll see. Fair. So, Ben, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. Ben Briard, I've, I'm about to hit 13 years, which is a, maybe a lucky number at Red Hat. I'm on a product management team. I've done a lot of different roles here, but these days really just focusing on Edge and how we're expanding the operating system to better suit the use cases and challenges that come with that. Awesome. Well, thank you for for stepping up and uh, and joining me today. And really looking forward to today's conversation. It'll be great. <clears throat> but before we can uh, dive into the uh, into our edge conversation, we need to bring in our guest today from On Logic, Cole. Welcome to Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. Thanks, Eric. I'm glad to be here and excited to talk to you guys about the edge. Yeah, this will be fun. And uh, if it's anything like pre-show, should be entertaining. So. Looking forward to, to today's conversation. But before we do, I think I said that like three times now. <laughs> it's what I get for eating like three seconds before we go live. Um, so first off, who are you? What do you do? And what do you do for fun? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an alien. I'm from Jupiter. I came to Perfect. Earth roughly 26 years ago to uh, take over and uh, you know extract all the resources. Uh, but uh, somewhere along the way, uh, I took the name Cole Langsus, and I'm the head of our sales engineering team here at Unlogic. So really, you know, when we talk about Edge, uh, you know, Eric, I think before the show, you're making a Star Wars reference, but uh, Edge is all around us, like midichlorians, right? So um, really, you know, when we talk about Edge, everything we do in Unlogic and industrial computing is Edge. Um, so really, the team I, I lead here is really focused on how, how do we spec out hardware for customers. And, you know, Ben and I go way back from my days on our partnership team here. I'm also the lead um, for any of the technical questions we have when it comes to folks like Red Hat or Intel. Um, I kind of help address that. I'm sorry. I didn't know aliens could be so handsome. Did you, Eric? <laughs> is that yeah. this is this is breaking news. I got to say, that is by far the most colorful uh, introduction we've <laughs> yeah. ever had on actually any show I've ever been a host of. So <laughs> kudos. You I like to mix really it up a little bit. It. Yeah. Well, you you got me. Uh, you, you threw me off. So I'd, great, great, great job. <laughs> 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 so obviously we're here talking about the edge. So I, th I think it's important for, for all the party people out there to to first understand what is the edge. It's, it's it's unfortunately one of those terms that all those marketing people, I know, I know I'm a marketing person, uh, but it's one of those terms that we've conflated to mean everything. Um, I, I think back to like now AI, uh, back in the day, everything was green, all, all the green technologies. So, you know, edge is just another one of those unfortunate uh, terms that has been conflated to mean everything. So in for today's conversation, when we say the edge, what are we talking about? All right. So, I, and I think that's a great question because it's something that, you know, I guess I get us all the time. And really the thing we got to separate out here is what do we mean by edge in terms of near edge and far edge? So near edge, if you think about that, I like to kind of classify that as, hey, we've got our main data center, we've got clouds. Um, all of that's really in a traditional data center setting. We've got these small regional data centers. We've got these uh, rack systems out kind of maybe in a very controlled environment. Think back at the store. I like to think of all that as near edge because a lot of the same challenges you have in a data center or um, even some of the lighter weight challenges you have at the near edge, let's say in the back of a store, it's all kind of similar from a hardware perspective. Um, now, workload, you start to get more resource constraint as you go farther towards the edge. Um, but really where these things kind of apply the most is at this idea of the far edge. So this is really where the rubber meets the road, so to say. And for example, 
um, Far Edge is really about talking about where the endpoints on your network are. So talking about getting, you know, really as close to the data as you possibly can. So for instance, you know, I think a great example would be, um, you know, at the farthest extremes of the edges, you've got, you know, let's say you're in the oil and gas industry, you've got storage tanks at your facility. You're monitoring those tanks with, you know, programmable logic controllers, PLCs, tank level monitors. Um, and you need to be able to collect that data and send that back off site to, you know, get real time status. You know, we're getting really far out there in terms of the network and also physically we're getting far out there. So the, the challenges uh, really change when we talk about the far edge. Ben, would you like to add on to that a little bit? No, I mean, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head, right? It's um, edge is big, it's broad, it's deep. And, you know, depending on what what segment or industry you're in, it's going to look really different. Um, not just from the physical proximity, but just the, the workloads, the size of the equipment, whatever the physical, you know, constraints are. Um, Another thing I like to, to say when I think about like framing for edge is that everything we have in the data center is a luxury that may not exist. And some environments definitely won't exist, like starting with physical security <laughs> um, or, you know, things like, you know, reliable electricity, air conditioning. <laughs> so it really just depends. And, and so you've got all these environmental challenges uh you know and, and there's people challenges too right um because we all like the concept of like lights out environments but you know if you have a problem at a retail store there's there's a person there right that can go push button if you tell them to but uh you know we we do have some customers in fact we I just met with one last week who like they literally have to fly helicopters if they want to go <laughs> go get to some of their systems so it's yeah it's a you can you can just imagine uh, the challenges that come with it. And yeah, love seeing and so, the system D chat. Keep yeah, <laughs> keep that going. This looks very familiar from your last session. Um, I, I, and just to comment on the challenges, to Ben's point, the 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 example of the helicopter, yeah, that's something that's on the extreme side, but it's not uncommon. You know, an eight-hour car ride could totally be. Uh, warranted for a lot of these remote locations but even when we think about edge within manufacturing if a system goes down that's critical for that production line um, i know we just collaborated uh red hat and on logic on a white paper that's just come out around this but um you know it's anywhere from a hundred thousand to a million dollars an hour in downtime and honestly that's quite low sometimes you know it could be much much more and that's per hour so even if, when you have these environments where you do have people that can replace systems, the reliability at the edge um, can sometimes be a challenge that people need to overcome. That, that's true. In fact, actually, a funny story. The guy who like got me at Red Hat, uh, when, one of his early jobs, uh, you know, s server is down, right? People are freaking out and the boss breaks in and he goes, because every hour that box is down, we're losing like two million bucks. What do you think his response was? He looks at the guy and goes, so I, so I shouldn't take a lunch break today? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Rattle. No, no, that's, that's, no, not at all. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really is a part of the problem. I mean, even just things like installing a package can sometimes be problematic at a uh, remote location. Uh, I've, I've heard similar stories. Uh, I think I was at a conference or something where someone was talking about having uh, basically edge devices, um, <clears throat> at the different, um, at different, um, not, not the light poles, but some of the junction stations and saying that if they have to roll a truck, they can, they can assume to spend a minimum of $5,000 to get a truck on site to fix a problem. And it could be something as simple as having to reset the, the device physically on site. So it's, it's a real and true problem. And, uh, uh, I, I had an anecdote to to follow up with that, but I I forgot what it was. The uh, <clears throat> the side conversation distracted me. But uh, <laughs> <clears throat> um, so so Cole, why don't you tell us where uh, where OnLogic fits into this? Tell us a little bit about the company and uh, and how it got into the edge space. 
Yeah, sure. So I'll give you the the short, long answer. Uh, the whole history in 30 seconds, let's say. So OnLogic was started back in 2003 by a husband and wife, a uh, couple of the Cronavelds. And we started really as a component supplier. At the end of the day, we were PC componentry. Seems pretty simple. But uh, one day, they got asked for an order. Uh, so could they put together some, you know, uh, off the shelf motherboards into, you know, install the CPU, install the RAM, attach some storage. At the time they didn't really do that, but they said sure. And it kind of evolved and we got into this space of the industrial computing. I mean, this has been a concept that's been evolving since the mid 2000s, really. Uh, <coughs> and it got to a certain point uh, where not only we were putting systems together, but we were designing some of the components ourselves. So maybe an off the shelf board with a case we designed ourselves. And, you know, some, you know, really when I started about five years ago was when we really got into this mode of we're going to do ground up developments. The boards are going to be designed by us, the cases, all the testing, you know, these are all things we do in house. So now when you look at any of our products, you know, 90% of the time, uh, you're looking at a system that's a ground up development from OnLogic. So like Ben's holding up a great example of that in the HX500. Um, and so really where we fit in is this, you know, people want a partner in this space because of these complexities, right? You know, you're specking out data center hardware um, or even office hardware, markets that are very commodity. But once you're talking about, uh, I always think of a great example, one of our customer case studies, Advanced Farm, it's a robot that picks strawberries, at the peaks times of ripeness. So now you have to worry about cameras, servos, sensors, robotic arms, cooking it up to a vehicle, it being deployed in a you know rough environment that's going to be knocked around and wide temp. The hardware considerations change. So what we do is we say, hey, you can call into us. We've got a whole team of folks here and then my team as well who are ready to help you guys spec out the hardware because it's, it's not always easy to find out what kind of hardware you need at the edge. So really specializing in those far edge type devices and making sure they work within the Red Hat ecosystem by you know certifying you know most of our catalog for that is really key to us because it does bring you know i think the the story together there's a lot that red hat can bring to the edge that's of a tremendous value because one thing you'll learn about the edge space is a lot of folks are behind the times hmm. no not in technology not in technology no of course not so ben do you want to talk a little bit about how uh red hat and in particular rel and on logic came to came to become partners and, and start working together on this issue? Yeah. It's all Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I think I may have made the first call or, or maybe it was Ryan, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've, I've been a fan of, of these systems for, for years. I think I saw the first one at uh, one of the Amazon conferences, but uh, they, you know, the idea of a fan list is always great uh, just from like a environmental perspective. I, you don't care about noise in the data center. You do care about it in a lot of other places. So that's always good. Obviously, there's like dust and other considerations for rough environments. By the way, uh, quick, quick, this is a true story. Um, uh, a large uh, retailer, maybe the largest, uh, used to always have this one store that would just continue to fail. And no one could figure out why. It would always go offline. And it, it was so bad that they had to send somebody to get on an airplane and go fly and sit and watch the room to figure out what's happening. I may have told this story before. I apologize if I'm repeating myself. Turns out a janitor would sweep the entire store and get this pile of dirt right in front of the door because it, the door had these little vents at the bottom and the dust would magically disappear. Didn't know that there's a big old server sucking in air through those and so literally <laughs> all the dust from the entire store was going into the server <laughs> hilarious but like this is this is real life stuff um so yeah anyway uh obviously there's thermal constraints and power stuff but but if you if you can't go fanless to these environments that's amazing uh so yeah i huge fan of that but anyway so uh in our our certification catalog we was, was a huge gap for us uh in this space and so on logic made perfect sense and and they were of course you know excited to work with us and we're very excited they have a really really great portfolio depending on 
like whatever you're specking or budgeting, like they have hardware that is purpose built for what you need, which is awesome. Not, not that other people don't, but you know, in their niche, it's awesome. And, and so it's a great fit for like our software, uh, just from whether you just need, you know, just a, just a lightweight OS uh, we do with RHEL, or if you need to do something with Ansible and like actually connect to everything around the computer, Ansible is super powerful for automating that or, uh, here in a couple months, we're going to release uh, MicroShift as in the form of Red Hat Device Edge. So, you know, spanning from just small standalone containers all the way to like Kubernetes orchestration and devices. Like, it's a, I think, I think it's a perfect partnership. And they and they look cool. Yeah, that's very they're true. orange. It's in, a it's a fact, differentiator. I tell people to look. If, yeah, they always say, well, what happens if a system goes down? I'm like, well, first of all. It's designed not to do that, so don't worry about it. But second of all, it's much easier to tell someone to look for the orange box versus yeah. the 50th black and silver or black on black box uh, that they're never going to find in a cobweb of Ethernet cables and switches and what whatever else is there. So, Cole, in, in, in the pre-show, you mentioned that uh, lifecycle is a huge benefit to, to going with OnLogic. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, <laughs> one of the things that's really key in this space, to your point there, is life cycle. So customers, you know, to us, um, is not just end users, right? It's folks that are OEMing our products into their steel rolling machines or their, you know, palletization systems. Um, so they need to have, you know, for, fit form function for a number of years. And that's a problem we see with the kind of commercial space is, you know, you may go, you know, 12 to 18 months uh, being able to get the same product from like some of the off the shelf folks. But then you might have to change it. And if you've spec'd your system around that, or for example, we do a bunch of medical, if you've FDA certified a box, you can't change it then. So, you know, we really standardize on about five years at a minimum. And then we go into being able to support people even longer than that based on their project needs. So, you know, that's the typical life cycle we typically see is that about five years, but three to five years is generally people replace systems. So it's super key for us to be able to support people on the same box for, for a number of years because they don't want a mixed fleet. And then that pairs very nicely with Red Hat's uh, predictable life cycle. You know, 10 years full support for a major version of RHEL, uh, predictable uh, releases. You know, every three years, we've got a new major. Every six months, we've got a new minor. So those can go very much hand in hand, especially with uh, with our RHEL for the Edge images. You can kind of pre-plan when you'd want to uh, use uh, RHEL for the Edge to, uh, <clears throat> to, to schedule those updates or to... Uh, to push those out and and kind of kind of drip in the updates in the back end and wait for for those updates to be ready to apply. <laughs> yeah, I, I like what you said about like you know the whole the the box can't change right over the life of the deployment and that's you know that's key to scale is is eliminating all like variants and and you know you have snowflakes at the software level and at the hardware, right? And so getting that down to where it's just, it is one and it's all predictable and consistent. That's like, that's table stakes, I think. Yeah, Ben, ben is the only snowflake allowed in, in this conversation. I actually, we, I put that in a summit talk uh, <laughs> and, and, and they said, you can't say snowflake, it's a fan. I'm like, oh, I don't mean it like that. I just mean like you're from an IT. I'm, I'm talking about AWS thing. ecosystem. <laughs> So, right. I'm talking about storage. Yeah, yeah. So is it minimize. Uh, I don't even remember what we changed it to, but anyway. <laughs> so not to put you on the spot, but you got a couple of questions here in chat that I, I wanted to raise. And the first, uh, first of all, was uh, Shantanu was asking about any future plans for AMD chips. Yep. So I can address that. You know, I I don't like the politician's answer. I like to kind of tell things like they are. So, uh, you know, we do actually have some AMD offerings, um, you know, on the lower end of systems. So we do everything from Atom up to Intel or um, Xeon Scalable or AMD Epic. Um, there's not as much difference now uh, between the Intel and the AMD on that lower end side. Um, so really, we, we do have 
like a couple on the small side with AMD. Um, but really what we see a lot of the benefit is also on that, you know, Ryzen kind of gaming CPU and in an embedded space, they do offer some embedded versions of that. And then also the Epic, uh, you know, generation systems, whether I think we're on fourth gen at this point, I uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but um, we find a lot more value in the kind of higher end server space that, you know, the top end of the line versus, you know, it, it's less differentiated um, at the low end. I do think, you know, from my personal perspective, um, you know, they both got great offerings, but Intel does have on the low end, and I think we'll get into that uh, if we want to talk about AI, AI at some point, um, some interesting features there that, you know, are, are really kind of cool and some stuff we saw at Summit that uh, if, if folks were there with the guys demo that, you know, can take advantage of that AI acceleration on board, some of the low end open Vino platform or uh, Intel XE graphics platforms. Hmm. <clears throat> So you all were at Summit, and uh, I didn't get a chance to see the full demo. But uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, about uh, being at Summit and uh, and what all was announced there? Yeah, so we had we had a a small booth uh, in the partner center, but really what I, I was super keen on seeing was the Edge Zone, and I, we ran into Ben there and all our favorite Red Hat folks. Um, and there was it made me very happy because there was on Logic hardware everywhere. You know, Ben, I think we were running the the with Ansible, we were running it off of a small box like this, if I remember correctly, uh, the whole demo space. Um, but, you know, one, and well, I'll let you chime in there actually for a second, if you yeah, want to comment on that. Say, I, you know, I think year before we had your hardware on stage during the, the big keynote. Um, yeah, it was. I think we screwed up and didn't do that this year. But anyway. It was yeah, on screen. Was... We didn't mention it, but it was on screen. But um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the... Uh, but so in the in the booth, yeah, that little CL250 you held up, mine's turned on right now, but uh, it was great. We chucked that into, it was, this was as edge as, as you could get. It was not ideal inside the little server closet thing. Uh, but yeah, it was crammed between a bunch of boxes and gaffer tape cords going to it. But uh, it was plugged, We it was cool because we did have a private 5G network you know, confined and registered to the booth. Like one thing I didn't realize is like when you set up these things, like it's literally positioned and registered for that area. So we have like four or five radios that I, I would have just assumed you could move them around like a Wi-Fi access point. Not the way it works, right? When you're out of a, out of a, what do they call those cages? Um, where it blocks the signal, Verity cage, but anyway. Uh, there apparently there are laws in the space. Uh, so uh, anyway, it was it was really cool though. So uh, we were provisioning these kiosks and running the whole thing over a tiny little CL two fifty, awesome awesome little box, uh, using literally all the new container stuff that's in nine point two. So that was that was pretty cool to see it do that without breaking a sweat. Um, yeah, made it super easy. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll mention the the demo that was really cool to me was um, you know so I mentioned. Uh, AI workloads with Intel, um, you know, something like this, which was our HX500, similar to the system Ben held up. Um, really, the, the idea that you don't necessarily need a discrete GPU to do inferencing at the edge. Um, you can take advantage of some of the acceleration technology on board, some of the Intel processors, and actually we'll talk in a little bit about some new products we've got out coming out that are enabled for that. Um, I think that's really cool, especially for the edge. And then once you layer you know, something like Ansible on top of that and the ability to do the model retrain and the manage the deployment. Um, that was a super cool demo and I was really excited to see that running. But on a, you know, on a lower spec device than you typically associate with edge inferencing, whereas I come from a background where, you know, a couple of years ago, it was everybody was just trying to throw GPU computed it and, you know, it was almost a brute force attempt in some some uh, aspect. If you, can, if you can even buy a GPU now. <laughs> Yeah, well, right. it's gotten better than how it was two years ago. I mean, yeah. I, I had to wait my personal computer for two years to buy my 3080. Ugh. Ugh. Painful. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite jealous that you had all this OnLogic hardware over the uh, in the edge space. But uh, in the REL booth, we were uh, using Lenovo laptops, which nothing against Lenovo laptops. But, I mean, it'd been nice to be able to run our demos and whatnot off, off an edge device. So Summit 2024, I, I hope to see some toys in the REL booth. I'm yeah. sure Jennifer from the marketing team is watching and is writing that <laughs> note down. <laughs> so we've we've kind of hinted at this, and and our our audience has seen uh, glimpses, but uh, 
you actually went into the office today to show us some toys. So I know Ben's got a couple and I know you've got a couple. So let's uh, uh, let's do a little bit of a fashion show here with with some on logic hardware because yeah. they are gorgeous. Absolutely. And yeah, just so you know, yeah, we are at an office company and these are not animatronics behind me. Those are real salespeople. I don't typically get too close because, you know, sometimes salespeople bite, but uh, <laughs> you, you told me those were your security team. So if you said something wrong, oh, come right. And, like, yeah. Yeah. Your they... Ethernet cord out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, they're, they're my handlers, my, my KGB <laughs> handlers. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's have some show and tell. Yeah, sure. So actually, I've got some stuff behind me too. But you know, to to kind of introduce the product families, you know, at the edge, you know, one of the things I like to kind of tell people when we think about this is this idea of there's bringing IT workloads to the edge, and then there's enhancing OT, and those are two different things, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of the times, and I think, you know, we were, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, Ben, but the idea of saying, okay for like an oil and gas customer or someone in the energy space, they want to run, uh, if you guys are familiar with this term, HMI, a human machine interface, basically a local touch screen to interface with controllable devices. This is a common thing in any kind of manufacturing space, logistics space. Did we need um, an acronym for that? I know we have one, but did we need one? Well, for human that? machine interfaces, uh, <laughs> that's a lot to say. That's a word salad. So yeah. I like HMI. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's basically a touch screen really at the end of the day. And the idea of, hey, I, I'm out there in the field and how do I kind of manage this? How do I manage this device like I would a laptop or a, a desktop computer in my office space if I'm an IT uh, professional? That is still a fairly new concept at the edge. So what Red Hat did in collaboration with us and uh, uh, a SCADA automation partner was really cool to see you know, managing those systems and making it scalable, right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about OT is this idea of how can we take these OT workloads and make it scalable? And why I go on that tangent is because a lot of the time it could be something as small as this, just a simple Atom-based device with some LAN ports, minimal processing on board, minimal storage to enable that. You know, if we're talking about just connecting to one sensor, something simple like this could be really a good fit. That kind of orange and silver pattern there is really the industrial line. So I'm going to hold up some systems. And then this is how you kind of go up from that. So as you need more power, obviously you can get a little bit more IO, but you get more compute power on board. So both these are, you know, I think this one is 13th gen, and this is our 12th gen system. Or sorry, no, they're both 12th gen. My bad. Um, that gives you more core I type performance. And you know, uh, you know, Ben, if, if you want to comment, like you know, some of the workloads we've seen on those, on the smaller devices, we may say rel, rel for edge, you know, uh, or just rel on top of the device. But the power of those to run something like OpenShift on the higher end is is totally a possibility and something we've seen. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, I will say it. Um, take like in in edge environments, you do have to be cognizant and conscious of like what are the constraints. And so, you know, if it is if it is a box like this, do you want to run applications that need a heap size of sixteen gigs of memory? Well, no. <laughs> You don't. So, like right sizing and like being cog, you know, cognizant of applications and getting your developers like, you know, participating in that conversation, not after the fact, uh, is a big deal. So, but yeah, uh, single node OpenShift could run without breaking a sweat, um, but still, you know, uh, it it matters what the application needs and how it was written and those expectations as well. Uh, just for an example, though, that that tiny CL250 you held up, like we were running uh, mostly just web traffic on that and a Node.js app and some other things over that network. I, and that thing's not breaking a sweat. So it's, you know, if you know a little bit about like performance and opti resource optimization, man, you got tons of power on these things. Yeah, and if it comes back to me and Ben that you guys are specking out 128 gigs for everything, we're going to come have a word with you. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> I mean, you could do uh, it. You could, you could absolutely do it, but it's just there are there are. Should you do ways. it? Yeah, should you do it? <laughs> um, so we talked a little about industrial, right? The that's really where you're talking manufacturing, you're talking logistics spaces. You know, I like to say like fixed site, 
rare, of like relatively fixed temperature, right? So like zero to 50 degrees Celsius. So for our uh, friends who use Imperial, 120 Fahrenheit. I mean, I'm an American, but I talk in Celsius here. Um, when we do need to go and do more, especially at the far edge, um, we can go up a level in terms of environmental protection. So something like these, and this is, these are a little bit heavier, so I'm not going to hold up the whole time, but you know, something like an atom class lower end device, and this is actually my demo unit that I bring to shows, um, or this system here, our carbon 800, that's along the lines of what we call rugged. So that's wider operating temperatures, so like negative 40 to 70 degrees Celsius, um, shock and vibration resistant for in-vehicle deployments, wider input voltage for if you're connecting direct to DC, let's say a vehicle's battery, it's got sensing to do that. Um, and there's also some additional features we typically restrict given the amount of power they draw. So like power over ethernet, if you're connecting cameras, we really stick with rugged because that generates a lot of heat on a single <coughs> network port. Uh, you need some additional thermal uh, design to make that work. Um, and so we kind of have the same scaling of, you know, the lighter weight, the data collectors, all the way up to the really high end performance boxes. Um, and beyond that, there's specialized product lines for, again, those panels, those touchscreen HMIs. And then we do have some servers, and I'm not going to hold one of those up because uh, it's going to take up the whole screen. But one of the things we just introduced was our AC101, which is super cool, right? It, it's very specific use case, but it's, it's really interesting because it's a short depth 1U. It's on Intel uh, Raptor Lake, so 13th gen. And what it allows us to do is kind of have this sweet spot in the market of we can do a full height, full length GPU in a shorter chassis and then utilize that a little bit less expensive than a Xeon uh, processor because that those typical kind of like higher end, I, I like to call them gaming SKUs, but they're, there's no, they're embedded versions of the gaming uh, processors you'll see in like uh, in someone's desktop at home. Um, they're long life cycle and they're a little bit lower TDP, so they're a little lower thermal wattage. Um, but it allows us to have a kind of higher end AI inference platform that can be deployed basically anywhere. You know, all these systems can be used for that, but if you need to like max a system out, like we can cover kind of the whole gamut these days. That's a cool form factor too, because like a lot of a lot of places that have like a you know the the server room in a closet kind of design, like you you have like the telco 19 inch rails and you have a punch panel and, and stuff. So you could you could rack and stack however many of those you need. Um, and they're they're cool looking. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or, or one thing we see is um, and one, one thing I've seen really is this idea of, OK, when we're talking about production line AI, um, you do want a fanless device that's accelerated or a slightly larger box like this one. I don't have the GPU capable version, but it basically bolts onto the bottom here. Um, where you're deploying more of a standard discrete GPU if you need that power. Um, but a new thing I'm seeing more so is if you're familiar like those like media rack short depth uh, cabinets with a little bit of cooling in them. Um, those I'm seeing more kind of lightweight edge servers deployed out there where people want to do a little more data aggregation first. Maybe instead of having three cameras connected to a device, they'll have three cameras go up to us uh, three cameras each for a production line go up to a switch and then go directly to the device um so that that's there's there's some interesting stuff happening there i still think it really depends on the customer's application but there's multiple ways to make this work at the edge with inferencing yeah and another thing that's kind of similar along those lines uh is we see um like a lot of specialty built boxes that are totally insecure and unsuitable to put anywhere and so using these as like a just a bash and node or like a you know security gateway type use case these are really really great um to kind of keep things isolated uh and that that type of that type of use case so a question came in about uh some of the hardware is uh are these devices user upgradable or are they meant to be ripped and replaced yeah, so it really depends on what you mean by uh, user upgradable. So like, you know, you could upgrade the RAM, you could upgrade it with a bigger drive. Um, it's not necessarily as simple as opening up the side panel on your desktop and or flipping over a laptop. It is a little bit more uh, complex, but it's not it's not complicated by any means. Uh, that being said, typically, you're going to want to have your fleet be standardized. 
And so one of the things that I talked about at Summit when I was presenting with my, my good friend, Josh Swanson, who's uh, on the Red Hat side and does a lot at the edge, um, is really this idea of building with scale in mind. You know, if you want to start with data collection, that's great. Like, that's a great start. But if your ultimate goal is saying, hey, I want to do predictive maintenance and I want to have a historian connect to my OT system and then directly on the same device be running that local runtime, okay, well, probably should plan for a little bit more horsepower so that you're not bottlenecking yourself. Because that, that's a, that is a kind of pitfall we see some people get into is they're like, well, year one, here's what we want to do. Year three, here's what we want to do. And it's like, well, can you balance those ideas out so that we're not having to replace hardware? Or can we augment this? Can we make this scalable in a certain way? Um, so yeah, it really depends on your use case there. But yeah, they can be user upgradable. You have the right to repair it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, one of, I'll, I'll, I'll just make, you know, kind of chime in on that. And, and really, you know, we have a, we're very open as a company. We don't try to hide behind, you know, any kind of BS. And, you know, you talk to engineers here, you talk to, uh, you know, I don't have to go through a ticketing stuff and go crazy all the time and trying to get the right answer or hide behind, you know, lies or anything like that. If you went on our product page, you can actually see in the technical section um, that's linked on almost every product, it'll show you how to open up the system. And if you want to get into it and play around in there, you're more than welcome to. I mean, if you break it, that's kind of your fault at that point. But, you know, it's, 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 it, we, we give you all the information. So when you do want to kind of be creative with the systems, you absolutely have that right. Hmm. Nice. Hey, actually, I got a, I got a random question for you, Cole. Uh, you know, supply chains during COVID were crazy. Chip shortages, they've been hard on everybody. Um, from what I could tell from an outsider, you guys seem to weather that, you know, as good or, better than uh, you know other companies like i never heard a, a story from you guys like uh 52 or 144 week delays like i never heard anything like that um it kind of seems like the supply chain's getting better I, i'm interested like from your side is it is it normal is it is it like how is it these days yeah um i would say so to, to your comment i think we did a lot better um, well, I know we did a lot better because I got quotes with our competitors' lead times on them during COVID. Um, but really, we I, I just want to give a shout out to our supply chain team. You know, because we are built to order, you would think, oh my God, that's got to be impossible to make work during COVID. No, we, we actually kept lead times much lower than everybody else in the industry because we were so proactive about it. And we made some tough decisions on how to, how to, how to make that work. But, you know, we had customers who were putting systems in ventilators that needed systems, you know, like... Uh, I can't, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the case study online, but you know, uh, there's a great picture of the system used being used to test uh, early in COVID, and we're like, look, we need our customers are critical applications. We can't be waiting 20 weeks to ship them systems. So uh, we did better. What I will say about the econ you know, everything going right now. Obviously, there's a little bit of an economic slowdown in the industry. I think we all recognize that. Um, I think the only parts I typically see constrained these days are parts where there's only a few vendors that make them. So for instance, you know, you, the underlying componentry of touchscreens uh, is oh, typically something that like, there's like, don't quote me on this, but there's, there's sure. like three to four companies that make those parts. So yeah. it's kind of like how I, I saw a great video the other day. I can't remember who it was from, but it was talking about how every microwaves made basically by the same company. It's it's kind of like that in a way. Like there's only so many people that make the underlying componentry for touchscreens. Uh, mm. So yeah, I, I typically still see that as a problem. But yeah, oh, it's definitely uh, it's improved so much. Yeah, and even with you know, I, I see in the chat Joshua with the the note on the thirty sixty wait time. Yeah, even now, um, you know, the GPU lead time's gotten a lot better as well, which was definitely a pain point. <laughs> So while we're randomly picking your brain, uh, Josh also had a question about uh, getting some recommendations for his home lab. <clears throat> so do you have a, a recommendation for small home lab passive cooling, or is that more for an enterprise deployment? What what are your thoughts on on running uh, on Logic in a in a home lab? Yeah, so we have uh, we are very familiar <clears throat> with the home lab program. If you know uh, Chris Novak, uh, him and I talk a lot. Um, so you know, red hatters, 
let's talk. <laughs> we can we can help you work out. I always say that if you want to start playing at the edge, something kind of like a mid-range box is a great fit because you can run a little bit more. You can play around with AI. Um, and if you want to do kind of lightweight data collection, it's not super big. Um, so you're not kind of taking up a lot of space. That's a great place to get started with with a home lab. But yeah, um, you know, really from our our focus is our customers are in the enterprise space and they're building machines. They're using the systems themselves at scale, you know, thousands of devices. But you know, we're, we we try to talk to everybody. Uh, at the end of the day, we we're not going to say, hey, you only need ten, get, take a hike. There's no minimum order quantity on these. By the way, if you went on the website today, you could pick <clears throat> out exactly how you want to build it, click add to cart, and we would ship it to you exactly how you wanted it. Hey, if somebody went to the website today. Isn't there like a new a new one today? Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. So the the <laughs> box I held up a little bit ago, that five hundred, um, you know, it's Intel tenth gen, and it was it's time for a refresh. And so I'm like really excited about this box. This is this is brand new, hot off the presses. Um, the website's up today, um, but this is the HX five eleven. So this is our kind of higher end socketed. Intel CPU system in a fanless form factor. And it's got a lot of really cool features. You know, not only do you bring the higher performance, but you know, one of the things that is super important in in the industrial space that you know maybe people don't always consider is the fact that basically everything we have has dual onboard NICs um, and are independent for networking. Um, you've got stuff like the locking power connector for wiring up to a DC power supply. You can see here, you know, you can do Wi-Fi upgrades uh, or co-location with 4G LTE. Um, and then we've got this little module here. You can't really see it, so I'll kind of talk to it. But there's a, you kind of have a proprietary header there where you could have any number of serial devices connecting off of that. Now, for those folks who don't play at the edge too much, they may be, you may be looking at me and saying, why do I care about serial devices? It's 2023. Well, oh. in the industrial <laughs> yeah. space, Serial is extremely common, whether 232 or 45, especially in the building automation space. If I took away 40 or uh, serial out of our systems today, I'm pretty sure they would, you know, throw me out the building. It and is for, super, super critical. For the younger people, we're not talking about breakfast <laughs> cereal. We're talking about like serial connections. Yeah, right. Serial cable. I, I drew the line at parallel ports and PS2, <laughs> yeah. but serial is here to stay for some time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that'll be on the newest Intel 12th gen. Uh, it's already, it should be at launch, official launch, Red Hat certified for eight and nine. Uh, and we're super excited about it. Uh, you know, we've launched the little oh, smaller yeah. one. Yeah, that, there you go. <laughs> we launched the slightly smaller one a couple months ago. And so now we've got, you know, our main products updated on that Intel 12th gen processors, uh, you know, brand, brand new. Uh, and we're, you know, really uh in a, in a good spot that's really cool well congrats on the launch that's awesome i'm now jealous because this one this one doesn't look quite as cool but it's still great um but yeah congrats i think you said you're going to ship me a, a couple of those right jennifer please take a note <laughs> yeah yeah hey, get get two credit cards from eric yeah no but i uh, the the comment you just pulled up is uh is is actually an interesting point if we want to talk about kind of power yeah please yeah so um to that point one of the things that we need to think about is not only resource constraint but actually power constraint at the edge so you're not typically getting you know we're not putting 500 watt atx supplies in this first of all a 500 watt atx power supply is bigger than this entire box um, you know, you're talking about specialized processors, but that still operate like a standard Intel processor. You know, they typically have a lower, uh, like kind of power consumption on the CPU. So you don't actually lose a ton of performance versus the 65 watt, for example, like it's like 10 to 15%. You'd kind of think it was, uh, not logical, but, uh, it, it linear, mm -hmm. um, but it, you do, you do kind of reduce the power, but then you can fanlessly cool the system. So, you know, if you kind of, we're thinking, why are there, why is there heat, this, these fins on the top? That's the heat sink. Instead of having like a, you know, a, a, a t traditional CPU cooler, that's how the systems are cooled all passively. So it's really about the surface area of the system. Um, 
but power becomes a really key problem for a lot of people. If you're putting a system, let's say you're connecting it to a security camera up on a pole, okay, you need to worry about the camera, the computer, any kind of other connected devices, maybe a PoE micro switch or a um, you know external cellular modem. Now, I always recommend people do them internally since we can offer that. We can put a 4G modem in them, um, but you may have a limited amount of wattage you can actually supply. You know maybe five amps. And if you're running at 12 or 24 volts, that just give you a ton of overhead. So yeah, on the small systems, uh, you know, like we're talking about like roughly 35 Watts total consumption. Um, but during runtime, mostly less than that, but that's like mm. absolute worst case for a lot of them. So yeah, low power is actually kind of key, especially when you start talking about on vehicle or on robot. Or in home lab where you have to get uh, get the spousal approval before you make that. Yeah, paper. I was going to say when your significant other sees the power bill for your home lab, <laughs> that, that's the that's that's the real concern. And if you do a desk lab like me, these cases can sometimes keep your coffee cup warm. But I will say it's not a supported use case to set a liquid beverage on top of one. So don't do that. Yeah, Isn't please that liquid, do not. Liquid cool. <laughs> please yeah. do not Isn't put them there. Means? They are not waterproof. Um, there's there's certain ways to make computers waterproof. They're really silly. Most of uh, to be honest, I always say you can get a waterproof enclosure for a PC and it's forty bucks, or you can spend seven thousand dollars in specialized connectors and Just get a waterproof the whole PC. Thing. Yeah, well, you, there's there's specialized connectors for it, and it's so expensive. And I'm like, just just forty dollars plus a thousand dollar computer, you're good to go. But yeah, Joshua, to that point, typically uh, the the comment you just pulled up, Eric. Uh, yeah, 120 Fahrenheit. That's kind of that where we typically see that kind of jump up to ruggedized systems is uh, at that roughly 50 degrees Celsius. Um, but yeah, do not put your coffee on top of the system. Not supported. But not 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 I'm, not a. I'm seeing a new system. product line. I'm, I'm thinking a new on logic product line. Yeah. Stainless cooled with a cup holder so that in the winter time you can keep your coffee warm. You know, I, I would keep an eye out for that. You know, uh, I'm not going to promise anything, but maybe Summit 2024. You know, I'm just saying, uh, maybe a little before summit, I think once <laughs> summit was end of April. So yeah, check, uh, yeah, I would say April, let's say first of 2024, let's say the old urban legend where some person thought the CD drive tray was a drink holder and broke it setting a drink. Yeah. That can't be real, right? No. So I, <laughs> I, I know where it's a little off topic, but I, I always think to my grandmother, uh, who's very not technically great. She, she always describes to me when she worked at Bell Telephone in the fifties that, uh, you know, she understood computers when they had punch cards, but with the keyboard mm. and stuff, she doesn't get it. But she, uh, we got her, you know, this was, late 90s we got her a vcr and she's like a brand new microwave and she thought you put the ham in the slot and so yeah <laughs> i figured i share that <laughs> um, so we we mentioned the uh the brand new shiny uh literally announced this morning we were we were we were really hoping that that wouldn't get pushed just so we could be the first so yeah. you heard it this is an exclusive release for rel if you've already got the press release <laughs> Ignore it. This is this is the official launch, by the way. Yeah. This this was the actual announcement. <laughs> um, but as I understand it, there's a couple of other lines, and correct me if we've if we've already mentioned them. But there's there's two on my list here that have been announced recently. Uh, yeah, the Axial. Yeah, so that's that kind of one use server. Um, we've had a kind of, ra we, I like to call it rack mount, but we've had a new server line for a little bit. Um, that's our first ground of development in that space uh, to have our own board or own chassis design. Um, but if folks want to talk to us about special use case two and four use, um, it is something we totally support. Kind of our sweet spot of the market, let's say is like, okay, you need a hundred to 500 and you know, you want something that's not necessarily off the shelf that maybe the other big guys aren't gonna entertain. Um, you know, maybe shorten the chassis or source a special GPU. That is something we have done uh, for customers. Hmm. Yeah. And then the other one would be um, the panel PC line, which is that touchscreen. So right now we still have, we do have products in that. Um, we have not developed our own ground up systems. I'd say that's definitely a potential in the future. Um, but we do have panel PCs that we've deployed thousands of already um, in that line. And actually, the P 
is actually already RHEL certified um, and is being deployed with RHEL in the field, I know for a fact, in, in the thousands. That, that was the first touch panel PC to ever be certified on RHEL, yeah. which is really cool. Absolutely. Then the other one was the uh, HX401. Yeah, so that goes into the that smaller type of box. So that 28 watt processor kind of, I like to compare these to a Nook because they're basically the same mm. size. If you're familiar with that Intel, um, that's one that needs to be an acronym. I'm never going to say next unit computing, next unit of computing repeatedly. Um, but so, a small form factor, but high powered core I um, it, it is really the fit for that. And then that 511, um, which I just held up is kind of the top at our end of the industrial line, that core I, but a little bit higher performance you know, really the kind of how we top out in that product. So uh, let's see, I, I lost the question here. Um, okay, so Shantanu asks, uh, what section would be ideal to use as build servers, temps, um, about 40C ambient uh, with AC if needed? So, so many choices on the website, awesomely confused. Yeah, so I, I think it really depends on the amount of processing power you need. So if, if we're talking a true server, we can, you know, we'll, we'll chat about what that would look like. Um, by AC, I'm not sure if you mean AC power or an AC like cooling. Um, if Looks you have like AC, power. yeah, it, power. So everything is compatible <clears throat> with AC power adapters. We offer those. Um, the rack servers are going to be AC only. You know, they're going to be 120 to 220 volt. Um, what I would say is, you know, we're happy to talk specifics about your needs. Um, but I always say, you know, like for, if the workload's not huge, okay, it, it is air conditioning then. Um, this can be a fit for a server, you know, small form factor, but if you do need stuff like 10 gig or a, um, or a BMC, we can talk about that. We have systems like Axial. We just got to then figure out, okay, how do we maybe modify the environment a slight bit? Um, uh, to, to, to support that. Cause that's, you know, the, the rack mount servers, that's going to be typically zero to 30 to five to, or zero to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, whereas the fanless systems can operate higher than that. <clears throat> I, I, I think I know where I'm going after the show. I've been looking at building out a, uh, moving my single node, uh, rel virtualization host over to maybe a small open shift cluster where I can, uh, use OpenShift virtualization and uh, and get my hands on on OpenShift as well. Don't uh, don't tell my realty. <laughs> hey, can't run so, OpenShift without rel. Great. This is this is very true. So we got a few minutes left, and awesome awesome interaction from the from the audience. Really love that uh, you all show up week after week to to hang out with us live. So if you have any last minute questions for Cole or for Ben, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, but before we wrap, I want to give you a chance to to give us your best your best pitch. What uh, why on logic? I mean, really sell it. This is this is your chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad our VP of sales is watching this stream. I'm no, uh, no, I, 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 we'll I, send the link out I unfortunately, I, I was, I was on the dark side, just so we're clear. I have a business degree originally. I'm, you know, I have an engineering title, but I do have a business degree. So I, I did, I did come from that background, you know, really at the end of the day, when we talk about IPCs, industrial PCs, the, there is an aspect to it where, you do need to configure it. You do want to find the right fit hard. You do want to use a great product. Like, don't get me wrong. I, our products are, are amazing products in this space. Um, you know, they're ultra reliable. They're configurable. So you can right size your application. But at the end of the day, like you got to like the company that you work with. And I think that's really what separates us. You know, we're for the most part, you know, when you talk to someone in sales here, or you talk to someone in support, they're located here in the US. All of our support techs are people who have been on the production line making systems for years, working and troubleshooting with customers when they need it. And really, you know, we kind of go that extra mile to make sure you get the right product and, and figure out what's right for your application. So I always say that like what makes us different, the hardware is, yeah, it is like 
kind of a step above the rest, but it's really that people love working with us because we're responsive and we understand your needs and, and do what's right and do what's fair for you. You know, not trying to say, not trying to do the used car salesman and you come in looking for a small form factor box, you know, with a seller on processor and you're leaving with the, you know, the i7, 64 gigs of RAM, the equivalent, let's say of your Nissan Leaf and leaving with a Nissan GTR. You know, the amount of times I've told customers that, hey, you don't need all this power to do what you're doing. You could save a thousand dollars a system. And yeah, we just think that's the right thing to do at the end of the day. So I would say, you know, just, I, I always like to end with a summary, but it, you know, we really do make great hardware and cool hardware, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, people like working with us. Yeah. I, I buy, I buy that. Right. The people, um, I think, I think at Red Hat, we, we feel that way too. I mean, obviously as an open source company, we, we have no IP. So it is kind of all about, um, you know, about the, the people at the end of the day. So, yeah, I think, I think that's good. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you like my outsider pitch on on logic and this is not a formal pitch so don't send this to your vp of sales but like it's it's like what is the opportunity cost of going with the cheapest subpar like because you know a lot of times these are a number of games right you're looking at a spreadsheet and you're trying to minimize cost and you're trying to maximize and sweat it out over the life of you know how do i get 12 years out of this piece of hardware but like people don't see the cost in doing that right until they they deal with it they're trying to put out fires as they go um i watched a really big company uh spec bad hard drives and a massive uh like private cloud deployment they did and dude the pain they caused themselves was ridiculous so going with a, a trusted partner like getting the hardware that's going to meet your needs right and is right sized is like getting the right thing not like a white label like I don't, I don't know. This is yeah. No, I, my, I, I, my, it's those hidden costs that you're going to avoid at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and just right. to, to expand on that, you know, when I when I think about what my pitch is, it's always you know, okay, well, there's other IPCs in the market. I think about it like that. But at the end of the day, Ben, you made a great point for this audience who's maybe not as familiar with the IPCs. Is yeah, you can when you're talking about deploying at the edge, you make the wrong decision. Yeah, exactly. You will save your he save yourself headaches later. The amount of times where I've had someone say, well, what about this box I found on Amazon for $200 less? I'm like, well, do you wonder why it has a seven-day warranty versus we have two years? All, you know, no, you know, a very robust warranty and, and options to expand that. It's because at the end of the day, we understand that downtime costs you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I've had that conversation many times where they're like, well, I don't know if we can justify the additional you know, a CapEx here to, to, to buy industrial hardware versus something off the shelf. I'm like, but how much money does it cost you in downtime right now? They're like, mm -hmm. oh, it's like $10,000 to roll a truck. Like, you know, we said earlier, five day, $10,000. Okay. And how many times have you replaced this? Uh, three times this year. Okay. So really you've spent fifteen to $30,000 on a $500 computer. Oh, I didn't really think about it like that. Like it, it is the kind of questions that people don't necessarily always think about up front is you know if you invest in the right technology you invest in reliability and if you invest in the right technology stack you know with with with, with red hat and being able to do stuff like we didn't talk about it but the, the fact that you can roll back your updates okay that doesn't necessarily matter you know i know it matters at the data center i'm, I'm maybe uh being a little bit hyperbolic but um when, we, when it comes to the edge it does matter like it, it really does matter because if that system gets out of your network then Okay, now the only way to go replace it is in the field. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I think I think it's a huge value prop. So. Yep. Well, I'll uh, I'll put it in the show notes. We actually had Ben Briard on a few months ago uh, for an episode specifically about RHEL at the edge. Uh, so uh, I think it was Brian and myself, uh, and and Ben all sat down and talked about the edge use case and talked about it from a rel perspective. So if you're curious to learn more about all the cool features and everything, definitely check that episode out. It'll be in the show notes. Uh, with that, that brings us to the top of the hour. But uh, Ben, any closing thoughts? Uh, rel 9.2 is out. It if is, it is. haven't checked it out, what are you doing with your life? Go do it now. Clearly um, nothing. Yeah, uh, I, I will say 
quadlet is there as tech preview and it is the coolest absolutely the most awesome way to run just onesie twosie uh pod man containers in production uh that is killer stuff so go check that out <coughs> that's my that's my closing pitch love it cole any closing thoughts yeah i'll do my best uh telephone fundraiser impression here but you know operators are standing by um if you called in no i'm like i i i'm joking but at the same time if you called in right now because you were interested in hardware you're going to get a real person either here in north carolina or at our headquarters in vermont and they'll be able to talk you through you know from your application to your needs go 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 reach out to us or if you don't like the phone i know a lot of people don't like the phone we have web chat we've got email just just come say hi and talk to us about hardware that's awesome all right. With that, uh, yeah, Shantanu says to grab a grab a cup of coffee and then go read the rail release yeah. notes. I'd, if you haven't done that, I mean, really got to question your your priorities in life. So, I mean, who doesn't read the release notes? I haven't <laughs> read the nine two release notes. I should. Actually, you should do <laughs> one of these shows about rail release notes. Just a whole episode on release notes. So, are you volunteering to co-host? No. Well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Depends. All right, folks. Well, thank you all so much for joining us live. Really appreciate it. If you're catching us after the fact, feel free to put your thoughts into the comments below. Um, myself or, or uh, McBrien, Scott McBrien and I are usually really good about getting back to those within a day or so. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks, and I didn't make a note of what the episode is. Um, so blame the host for that. Uh, Scott and I will be live on Friday for Into the Terminal. We'll be talking about some of the new features in Image Builder as of RHEL 9.2. Uh, so definitely don't want to miss that. Join us again in two weeks uh, for an undecided episode of RHEL Presents. I'd, I've got a schedule here somewhere, but it's buried under tabs. But anyway, um, Cole, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate our partnership with OnLogic and uh, really enjoy seeing you all around. Um, and now that you've been on the show, Ben can get off my back because he loves you guys so much. Um, but uh, Ben, thank you so much for, for co-hosting with me. Cole, again, thank you. And on behalf of OnLogic and Red Hat, thank you all for joining us live. Be sure to like, them, sub like and subscribe, and we'll see you on Friday. Thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs>